Hello and welcome to the Shepherd's Crook Podcast. Hope you guys are having a great day today. I have a really exciting interview on the list today. I'm excited to talk to a new friend. And uh, before we do that, before I introduce him, just want to remind you of a couple things. Uh, number one, we have the membership that's going on. If you want to be a member of the Shepherd's Crook, reach out to me, just message me. would love to get, uh, to get you on the list and that will get you access to the newsletter that comes, a physical newsletter to your mailbox, wax, seal, and everything. If you went on that list, let me know. And once a month, you'll get that coming to your mailbox at the beginning of the month. Also, at the end of the year, like I've always said, I want to give you access, ownership over access. So you're going to get a thumb drive of all the content, video and audio at the end of the year. And so please, if you want to sign up for the membership, you'll also get access to the uh, and the downloadable material for the Rites of Passage series about raising sons into men. So if you want to be a part of that, please reach out to me. Also, just another reminder, we started the Sons and Slaves podcast, me and my boys. So it's fun hosting the, the conversations with my sons, and you guys want to jump over there if you're interested in that at all, and please sign up. All the links will be in the show notes, and like I said, any questions you have, please reach out to me, and I'll get you all that information. Okay, now, new friend. I've been watching from afar for a little bit, and actually, I'm, I'm having him on because I heard this conversation where he was just talking about the Lord and excited about what God is, is doing in his life and has done in his life, talking to Wayne Endicott today. Wayne, how's it going, brother? Yeah, wonderful. It's uh, it's a bit early this morning in Oregon, but it's a good morning. I'm Amen. up early in the morning anyway. That's right. We're going to get to that, actually. That's going to be a surprise question about how you started getting up early in the morning. I've been doing that for a while as well. It's just an amazing thing. But let's go ahead and pray first and mm -hmm. ask for the Lord's blessing on this conversation, then, then we'll get Absolutely. into it. Father, I thank you for a friend and a, and a brother across the across the country, and I thank you for what you're doing in his life, what you have do, done in his life. I thank you that you have blessed the work of his hands and have been merciful to him and seen blessings into his family and uh, just his life, uh, a lot of exciting things that he's got to live and see, and so I'm excited to talk to him about that. Pray for blessing upon this conversation for everyone listening in. God, I pray they would be encouraged. Holy Spirit, apply perfectly the content that's going to be happening here in the next uh, little bit to the lives of the listeners. And I pray that they'd be challenged and, and built up and called up into something and uh, got us any other areas that they need to repent and change. I pray that you would grant that and you would help them as well as they're listening in. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, brother. Well, go ahead and bring us up to speed. There's going to be some of my listeners that know exactly who you are and have maybe followed you for a while or, or know about the bow rack or what you do, but bring us up to speed a little bit. Just tell us about yourself and your family and then what it is that you do. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I was born here in Springfield, Oregon. I'm a native guy. You know, I grew up in agriculture, you know, corporate farm. Uh, my dad had two big corporate farms. You know, I was the last of the Mohicans of a blended family of nine kids. Um, that's, that's kind of the beginnings and grew up in a fantastic moral household um, my granddad was somewhat of a, uh, evangelist and, and, you know, basically planted church, uh, here in, in, in our local area. And my father, for whatever reason, when he was 14 years old, and, and I got the story a lot of different ways, but he, uh, he rejected, you know, church, church life, everything mm. about it, you know, used to explain to me, you know, how the preacher used to hit the pulpit and say you were going to hell. And he rejected all that. Mm. And used to, at the age of 14, started running away, you know, to the river. And, and, uh, you know, my dad was a big influence in my life, you know, um, and, and as time moved on, you know, without any foundation, I didn't know one scripture out of the Bible. I mean, he basically preached against the Bible, you know, um, I wouldn't say preach against the Bible. He preached against church. Okay. You know, he always used to tell me, oh, I, you know, I'm just going to keep the Ten Commandments, which we all know that's impossible. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a good person. And that was kind of his whole, you know, realm. And he, it, I remember as a kid, you know, people coming along and you would try to share with my father. And, oh, my gosh, you, you know, he was he would shut them down, you know, basically as quick as they started, hmm. you know, and uh, was a completely closed book um, to it. So that's, that was my upbringing. And I just turned into the rottenest worst kid that you could even imagine growing up on a corporate farm and, hmm. and everything. And, and uh, you know, that, that portion of it, you know, if I want to share my testimony early, you know, until the age of 18, you know, my mom tried to take us to a Lutheran church. I remember one time, Okay. And my dad just shut that down immediately, you know, and uh, that was probably about the closest I came to any kind of church involvement, you know, as a kid. 
And, um, you know, by the age of 18, you can only imagine that I was like the worst form of an 18 year old that you mm. could even imagine. Gotcha. Um, I had probably ran through every window and door, including being a terrible rebellious teenager at that time. And, you know, my dad was born in 1917. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I came up, my teenage years were in the seventies. I graduated high school in 1980. And so you can imagine in that period of time, you know, just a kid that, you know, had no direction, no mm -hmm. anchor, no foundation, right. you know, nothing. And, uh, you know, I, I fully understand today, you know, what kids, you know, that are struggling go through you know, mm. very, very clear in my mind, you know, what, what a kid struggles with and, uh, and what he's drawn to. And I've got a couple of them, you know, that even work for me, you know, that I know that I've shared with, and they, they kind of run the same realm, you know, that, uh, that, that I do. And, 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 you know, they see me kind of as an anchor and they test me a little bit, you know, but I know mm -hmm. how their thinking works, you know, because I was there, right. You know, I was fully there. So when I came to Christ, I mean, it was a dynamic experience, you know, like none other. I mean, you know, for me to basically become honest, um, it was uh, uh, a girl that actually, you know, attracted me to go to church, you know, in my senior, senior year of high school. Okay. And, you know, I remember her dad was kind of a retired pastor, was working at one of the mills here, you know, just a precious man of God. And he liked me. I mean, I have no idea why, but he liked me. Um and, you know, I remember the first time I went sitting in that pew, there was no way to escape. And everything that was going on there, you know, was was just like my whole being was just in screaming like run. Hmm. Uh, you know, you can only imagine and, you know, it would have been probably 1979 or 1980. Okay. I think it was probably 1980, you know, uh, old school Pentecostal Assembly of God Church. Okay. You know, <laughs> And there's a lady stands up and speaks in tongues and a guy stands up <laughs> and man, I am like, what, what have I gotten that? into? <laughs> what is that right there? I, what is going? And then what is that? Uh -huh. you know, I'm, just like, I'm just sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm the worst example of um, a kid full of every kind of wickedness and demon you could even imagine. And I'm just squirming like a, mm -hmm. like, a like a snake and man, um, <laughs> You know, and as time went on, you know, I, I, I had to be honest with myself, you know, um, why didn't I like it? Why didn't mm -hmm. I like them worshiping? You know, why didn't I like the songs? You know, why didn't, you know, what, what the, why, I didn't understand a thing that the pastor was, you know, preaching about, you know, why, why, mm -hmm. you know, why is this whole world here? Something I don't, I don't even understand. And then, you know, one of the youth pastors got a hold of me one time and he asked me, you know, he, he said, you know, why, you know, Wayne, if you die, what, you know, are you, where are you going? I mean, mm -hmm. you can't ever help. Well, there was one thing as a young person that I understood really clearly is that, you know, there was three words basically that I understood, you know, there was, there was hell, there was holy, and mm -hmm. there was Jesus. Mm -hmm. Those words, you know, for somebody who had not one, you know, speck of knowledge of, of the word of God. Yeah, you know, I knew those three words, but you know, I knew them in an unholy manner mm -hmm. you know, because I was a servant of the wrong, the wrong God. You mm -hmm. know, you only yeah. imagine, you know? and so you know, for me, it was just like you know, I I think you know, the Lord just was you know, basically you know, saying, hey, you know, what, you know, Holy Spirit was working in my life, and I had no idea what the Holy Spirit was, mm -hmm. but you know, when I came to the Lord, it was such a dynamic experience because I actually had, you know, I felt like I had hot. Like I like when I prayed to really surrender to the Lord mm -hmm. um, for the first time in my life, you know, I, I felt like hot air went out of me. I felt weak wow. physically, but for the first time in my life, I felt clean. Mm -hmm. you know, I felt I, I had never felt that. Mm -hmm. I felt shame wow. in my life. You know, I, you know, as a teenager, I can remember loading a shotgun and putting my finger on the trigger and listening to rock music and, sit, you know, living in a world of self-pity. Could have mm -hmm. been anything. Could have been, you know, rejection at high school. Could have been. I understand why kids kill themselves. I mean, yeah, I was right. I was right at that door. I mm -hmm. used to push on that trigger, and you know, wow. you know, for God's, you know, hand, it didn't, it didn't go off. Yeah. You know? 
So you well, you came. Well, I'm I'm curious as what your father was thinking through this process. Were you talking to him, or you just knew that was something we don't talk about? What well, was that I, like? You know, I I don't know if you've ever been around any you know old timers that were just hardcore guys that came through the depression, but you know my dad was man. I mean he was a, he was he was a good man. He he you know but there was no <clears throat> sign of affection. He wasn't a hugger. He didn't ever. Mm-hmm, right. I can remember maybe three or four times in my life where he actually maybe even told me he loved me, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, work, work ethic. I mean, you know, there was a time when they were hungry and, and uh, it it just left a deep, deep furrow in his life, you know, and, and so farm life work, you know, every day up early work until dark, you know, Um, my mom was a hard worker too, you know, Mm -hmm. and trying to raise this blended family and, it was just crazy, but there was not a lot of communication. Yeah. You know, my dad would sit me down and he would charge me, you know, like he would sit and charge me, you know, and I, I kind of like that. You know, I actually had uh, an elderly gentleman the other day and we sat here in this same office and, and he's an old retired pastor and he came mm-hmm. in and he was, he was charging me. And I like that, you know, because mm-hmm. I grew up with that, you know, right. I, I understand that. And, the, and, and so, you know, but that, that was our communication. You know, there was never any like, son, what are you thinking? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> he was going to program you on what you were thinking. Yeah, you know, exactly. There was, there was no real communication that way. You know um, you know, it, it was, I was told later in life, you know, because I had no understanding of it because in Oregon, there's no cotton, but you know, my nickname growing up on the farm was that cotton picking stupid kid. Mm, that was wow. my name. That's what wow. I was referred to by my father. And, and I earned that. Honestly, mm-hmm. I earned that every bit of it because I was, I was terrible. Mm. Um, you know, I was just, I was always off in a fog and day, I was a daydreamer, you know, and dad could give me five tasks to do and I'd be halfway through the third one and forget the other two. And yeah, <laughs> right. He had to tune me up on a pretty regular basis, you know, yeah. but um, you know, that's, in a nutshell, you know, that's how my early birth in, in Christ came to be, you know? Yeah. Right. And, uh, um, you know, there's a lot more to it, but, um, you know, I felt like I received the baptism of the Holy spirit about six months later, which really, you know, launched my life, you know, okay. because it was probably six months and I hadn't really prayed on my own, you know, okay. I, I, you know, if you're involved in one of those old Pentecostal churches, you know, if they're, you're absolutely willing for anything and you got, you got seven men with their hands on you and praying for you, you know, mm-hmm. it was, you know, it, it was that, you know, and then I had a lot of mentoring early and just a lot of, you know, and, and, and as a kid, you know, here I'm a baby Christian. I'm just as, I remember, I remember one thing distinctly, one of my partners in crime in high school, um, he, uh, he he accompanied me on some of the worst things that we could you could ever accomplish as a teenage kid high school mm-hmm. kid. he was there all the time had enabled him by two parents enabled him um he would they had two parents that he could he could do no wrong okay one of those he, kids innocent even if proven guilty he was innocent so that yeah. was the parenting thing he had and if he was guilty it had to be his friend's fault it was mm-hmm. never Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to this kid after, you know, probably about four or five weeks, you know, I went to this kid and and I told him, I said, Hey, um, you know, cause he's like, Hey man, we're going to buy beer. We're going to, we're going to hook up, you know, what are we doing Friday night? And I'm like, not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Like what's up? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm becoming a Christian. Yeah. (laughs) God's at work. I'm, I, there's been some change in my life and I'm going to, he goes, Oh, it's, so, so what? Let's go. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, there's no, so what he goes, what he goes, no, he goes, he goes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm like what? <laughs> and he goes, dude, he goes, I go to church every Sunday. I go, there's no way you go to church every Sunday. There's Sundays that you couldn't even be alive after uh-huh. Saturday night. Uh no way you go to church and he's like no i do (laughs) and he goes he's like i'm like you're not a christian and he goes Uh no and that was the end of our relationship i'm like (laughs) like something's off here yeah and to this day i still know him and he's still not oh man Um, well okay so anyway that's that's as to say but 
you know, I get back to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it had been like six months probably. And my dad called me and I was actually working in a manufacturing shop right out of high school. Okay. Welding, and it was the weekend and my dad called me and he's like, son, he goes, my crops are burning up. He goes, we, you know, we used to have a lot of, a lot of row crop under irrigation. And mm -hmm. I know back in your country, you don't use irrigation, but out here in Oregon, you know, we have sandy soil, loamy soil. We have to use irrigation to grow crops. And so mm -hmm. back then it was all hand move, you know, pick it up, move it over there. Yeah, and okay. the hotter it is, the more you have to irrigate. And so from, you know, dark early in the morning till midnight, you might be moving irrigation, trying to keep crops from burning up. Okay. And so he called me, said, you need to come down and help me. And I did. And I was in this, you know, we had this little camper thing that, you know, help would stay in, you know, and we had a lot of farm help. And so I was out there sleeping that night and I just came to this point. I'm like, Lord, you know, I'm not, I, I'm going to go back into the world unless, you know, I, I know for sure, you know, I know I had this experience, but I'm like, it was just an honest prayer. I'm like, Lord, I, I, I got to know, um, I got to know, you know, that you're real. You know, mm -hmm. kind of an honest prayer because you know reading the bible and going to church and i mean and i you know here i'm you know this 18 year old kid that just graduated high school i mean i don't know which way i'm going and mm -hmm. being an infant i'm just crying you know yeah. i'm just a crying infant you know in christ and and um and i can't explain to you what happened but it was like the lord just picked me up and held me close and Mm -hmm. And it was just a crazy experience. And uh, I don't know how, I can't even tell you how long it went on. Mm -hmm. But when it was over, I blew out of that that camper and, and my feet hit the ground. And it was in August. I think it was, you know, either late July. It was like this time of year, okay. it was in July, early August. And um, I looked up at the stars and it was just a really moonlit night. And I looked up at the stars. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I go, God's real. Mm -hmm. wow. and, and And it was just. It, that's all I could say for the longest time. And I mean, I still had no knowledge of the word. I mean, I was just listening, trying to learn, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, very, you know, it was, you know, I was, I, I, and at that point when I hit that wall, you know, I, I was, I had all these areas, you know, growing up, I had all these buddies that went to all every rock concert in Portland and scalp tickets and, mm -hmm. and all, all into rock music and, man all of a sudden i grabbed all and it was back this this is gonna date me this was eight track tape days <laughs> okay yeah, I, think yeah. I had a cassette play i think i had a cassette player in one car so i had a bunch of cassettes but i rounded them babies all up and i burned every one of them yeah gotcha and, get that and, out of there I, it was no more rock music and i was discovering contemporary christian music and okay worshiping the lord randy and, stonehill yeah and bob <laughs> larson he wrote a book he called bob larson's book on rock or whatever okay Okay. And I bought that book and I read that because here's all these guys that I scalp tickets in Portland, everybody that came to Portland. And I'm like looking at what they're involved with, you mm -hmm. know, Jimmy Plant, you know, and mm. I think he bought Anton LeBay's. Oh, manager. wow. I mean, there was all this stuff, you know, and, you know, at the time I was just all enamored into why, you mm -hmm. know, what, what was the purpose? What was the drive behind all their their wickedness and their lifestyle and everything and yeah and why i made this change and why and i needed to build i guess the lord was building that foundation that part of my life to make sure that i was grounded in all that because you know i i knew looking back that i wasn't going to go back yeah and so, and so you know it, anyway that experience just cemented me in my yeah. life you praise know? god and um and stuff so anyway that's that's kind of the early testimony and, and mm -hmm. stuff. You know, from that time on, you know, I worked uh, a lot of different jobs, you know, went to college for at the age of 26, went back to college, got married, okay. young, um, lost that marriage. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to it, it was much my fault as anything. When I lost that marriage, I kind of fell away, you mm -hmm. know, and never lost that. Well, you know, when you say fall away, I mean, you know, I was, you know, it was horrible time in my life. It was kind of a dark ages. You know, I had enough of a foundation to know that I was never going to lose that foundation. And I mm -hmm. always, you know, hung on to it. But, you know, it's it's a it's a shameful part of my life. And yeah. uh, you know, since then, um, since that point, it was probably about, oh, it's been a solid 18 or 19 years ago now that I I rededicated my life and then that was a process and 
of, you know, commitment and everything. And then just really in the last, you know, 10 years to really move into, you know, more of a, a servitude type you yeah. know, uh, okay. lifestyle and, and we're just wondering what the Lord's bringing next. And as far as occupations, I mean, I bought this archery shop when I was, I think it was 27 years old. It's been 34 years okay. this year that I've owned an archery pro shop. And the Lord just blessed us. I mean, there was a lot of slim times. There was times through the 90s where, you know, my wife, I, I remarried, wonderful woman, been been remarried now. I think we're going on, we're going on 28 years this okay. year. And, uh, you know, there was times that she would run the archery shop with one employee and I would swing a hammer all winter, be, you know, all through the nineties, late nineties, especially we did that from about 96 on. Okay. So it gave me a good skill set for carpentry. And, you know, of course, you know, the archery shop, there was all kinds of guys coming in in the trades. And so in 1999, we, I, I bought a, <laughs> I had a, I had a banker, just a precious man. I mean, it turned... Hey Wayne, before we get to that, let me ask you just a question in general sure. about hunting that led you up to that point. And it sounds like because you grew up in a home with a father, and I know that type, I know that that depression era, the war era type of guys right. that didn't give you a hug or tell you they love you, but they right. worked they worked hard and they taught you to work hard. You caught a work ethic, it sounds like. So it sounds like early on, even though you were, you know, you didn't know anything about God, the Bible, you know, anything at all about life, but it seems sounds like you did know about work and um it sounds like uh you know early on you also developed a love for hunting i am curious because i this is i got into hunting when i was in my mid-30s and gotcha. it's midwest hunting so it's totally different i could be in the, my stand in eight minutes from my bed you know kind of thing <laughs> yeah. totally totally different you know and then i yeah. so I, I bow hunt and i gun hunt i'm just i'm actually now going to be getting a crossbow for my son who's eight my son ransom so he's oh, gonna wow. be sitting in a stand this year with a crossbow for the first time right, right. and uh wow. And so I, I've been absolutely loving it. I've got to, I've got to shoot a turkey. I shot a bear in Minnesota, just been having a blast with it. Right. And, uh, right. So how did you, so has that always been a part of your life? And, Cause I mean, that, that's a part of the story that leads up to why you'd even want to buy an archery shop. So why, right. why did you even oh, want to get gosh. into that? I was the kid that, you know, um, <laughs> my mom used, there was a place here in town called Anderson Sporting Goods and, you know, I just begged my mom to take her and it was everything sporting goods store. And it was, okay. it was gotcha. forever. And, you know, she'd take me in that store and I, you know, I just purposely lose her and just, you know, run around and look at everything. And, you know, just, you know, we got to go son. And I'm like, Oh no, we got to just stay a little bit longer, you know? And, uh, and then if you drove by it, we had a taxidermy shop here called Adam's taxidermy for years. And there was this big window and it had all the mounts and it was just this big giant showroom. Okay. And I begged my mom to stop. And I would just stand there at that window and just stare into there. And, you know, my dad, he, he was, he was quite a hunter. He was a gun hunter. He wasn't an archery hunter. He was a gun okay. hunter, brought me up gun hunting. And he was a, he, he was a backcountry guy. I mean, we would, take an old farm truck and after all year of you know running the farm we'd load up a bunch of pasture green horses and we'd head off to some wilderness area in Oregon and unpack them horses and just have the biggest rodeo you could imagine halfway mm -hmm. and settle down and, and we'd get to a camp and you know game populations in the 70s in Oregon was rich Okay. You know, a lot of deer and a lot of elk. And so hunting was good and we just get it done and come home, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad wasn't into the long trips, you know, it was a lot of work, but he was just a, he was just an old backcountry guy. And it's the okay. way they all did it. You'd go in, you'd put this camp in a week before you went, then you'd ride the horses back into the camp and, you know, throw everything out and dig in like ticks and, you know, you'd get, you know, you'd be ready to stay forever, but you mm -hmm. know, we'd get it done right away and, oh, we got to get this meat out and away we come. Mm -hmm. And that was deer and elk hunting growing up. And it was probably the time that my dad and I kind of connected the most, you know, okay. hunting and fishing, you know, trips like that were, you know, and he didn't need to pr promote it with me. I mean, I was just, I was the kid that would be sitting there in class and something would be going on and the teacher would call on me, but I'd be somewhere in Eastern Oregon you know, <laughs> reimagining and reliving the whole, you know, deer hunting experience where right. we killed some big buck or something. And I was still there. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. you're waking me up here. What, what, what? <laughs> That's what school's for, man. I'm hunting, man. I, I'm, 
That's what school's for is daydreaming, uh, right? <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mr. Webb, but I was, I was in Eastern Oregon and I was on a hunting trip. You know, I never said that, but you know, that's where I was. That's what my way my mind worked. You know? Yeah. Right. And so I, you know, from a very early age, I was just enamored with, you know, mm-hmm. outdoor lifestyle outdoors. I mean, it was an escape and that was probably the one thing that kind of preserved me. Cause I saw a lot of kids, you know, in high school, cause I was around a lot of kids that were just throwing their life away big time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, <clears throat> Drinking was a part of my, you know, my young life, but you know, the drug thing, you know, I saw kids early on that were getting, and I'm like, I, you know, I kind of want to fish and hunt. Mm -hmm. I think the Lord really implanted that in me to kind of preserve me because I mean, I saw kids that just had no purpose. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, if if anything else, I want to fish and hunt. Mm -hmm. And so that was a deep passion, you know, early on because I mean, that was such a connection. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that's, that's kind of what was my driving force, basically, you know, um, always well, never, never really imagined that I could be a shop owner or anything, but the bow rack had been existent in an existence since 1974, Ron Schreiber started it. Okay. And so, you know, all through, you know, one of my buddies, you know, in, I think it was a year after high school. He's like, Hey, he goes, you know, he's, we wound up working at a mill together Okay. Um, after high school. And he was telling me all kinds of, you know, bow hunting stories. And the next thing I knew I was hanging out down at the bow rack and bought my first golden Eagle bow. And, and man, you know, we shot a few arrows and we we're going to go big, 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 big bow hunters that year. <laughs> right. And I think right. that first year, I mean, of course, we drug off into all the places that I gun hunted. And back in Oregon, back then, it was just wide open. I mean, you could mm-hmm. go just about anywhere except for, I think, Heart Mountain. You guys had okay. to go for Heart Mountain. But it, everything else was a wide open, you know, uh, just buy a archery tag and go hunting. And, and bow hunting and, back then is not like it is today when it comes to the equipment and the gear. I mean, it was, it oh was a totally God. different world back then, right? <laughs> um, we used to shoot. We used to shoot 20 yards at a square target with a broadhead. And I mean, the equipment was so antiquated. I mean, you know, we didn't even have a launcher rest. We were shooting these overdraws. I mean, there was like a handful of arrows. There was like 22 19s. There was, um, I, I think, I don't even think we had 23 17s. I think we had 24, 20, 21 17s, 21 14s and 19 22-19s. I think that okay. was our selection or the mm-hmm. shop that we had that's all they had for mm-hmm. eastern arrows. And we used to you know I remember shooting a 21-14 at 80 pounds with an overdraw and a gold eagle bow just <laughs> hoping that you could hit that target when you put a broadhead on. You know, I pray your prayer that. life goes through the roof. God I please. I mean, bow tuning <laughs> wasn't even anything we even knew, you yeah, know. Right. It's like, well, if they got longer fletches, put them on. Put more of them on. Mm-hmm. You know, let's do four flats, you know, let's see, this is like, we didn't have a clue, you yeah. know, and we're just trying to rely on the shop and we're like, why are our arrows fly so horrible? We put these, you know, even you have hundred grain broadheads back then you had like, yeah, you know, I think there was some, I think we wound up with wasps, wasps okay. like the best, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, it was just a trail of tears as far as equipment goes, but uh, I actually missed, I used to keep a really good count. And it's been so many years since they've been told this story. But the first year I bow hunted, I think I missed 13 bucks. Oh, my. Row. And I missed the buck I killed the very first year I bow hunted before I killed him. And okay. And we, we'd, we'd hike back into this wilderness area. My buddy and I spread out. He bumps this deer and it comes running. And it's like, I looking back, it was probably like 35 yards. But back then you had a 10-yard pin. <laughs> You had a 15 yard pin, you had a 20 and a 25 and a 30 and a 40 yard pin. I think that's about all we had on, on an old pin site, you know, mm-hmm. and no guard, just pin sticking out there. And I miss this deer. And it was like back then, if it wasn't 20, it was 50. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what you thought. And we had yeah. random miners. I mean, there was, there was nothing, you know, it's like, you just had to, and the bows were so slow. Literally, you could throw rocks faster in those old bows. <laughs> there. And you had to shoot 80 pounds to even get like 215 feet per second, you know? Wow, wow. And 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 shoot this overdraw and all this crazy stuff. But anyway, um, I missed this buck. And I shot right over him. Well, the arrow goes skipping up through the rocks. And he turns and he runs down a little dry wash while I was on this side. So I was just mad. I just mm-hmm. ran as 
as hard as I could down this dry wash, the direction he went, you know, he went one dry wash and there was another one right there. I was on a little ridge. And so I ran down that dry wash, probably, you know, five, you know, probably three, 400 yards. And I ran up to the top of it. And this deer just happens to be right below me Mm -hmm. running. He hears me come over the top and he stops and he's looking every direction. And I was just drew back and I was just like, I can't even remember what pin I threw on him. I don't even know how far he was. I just threw a pin on him and I was so angry and I shot and, and the arrow hit him in the neck and hit him in the shoulder and broke his shoulder and he fell on a bucket of bricks right there. Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, I'm a big bow hunter. Yeah. <laughs> You've arrived. I, and, and I just stood there and yelled. Uh-huh. And I, I probably for yeah for probably 45 minutes I just stood there and yelled and my but here comes my buddy Jeff Brooks and he comes be- peeling over the hillside hearing me yelling uh-huh. running and uh-huh. he runs up to me and and he's like what are you yelling about I didn't know you had to kill some and I had even gone over to the buck and he was laying it was pretty open country and I just point at him he he looks down he goes oh my gosh you know yeah, was, that's awesome i just got him up in the shop he's right over my door still it's a hundred year old mount you know but i got him mounted that's but awesome he's so, 30 i think he's 33 inches inside and he's like a big you know you what you, we, we have a different count out here he's got like split eye guards okay he's like a three by three you know nice just really wide he doesn't score very good but he's just big and heavy and old and and you know he's he's something to look at you know that's but so that, cool you know that launched the whole big archery career you know was that first kill that was just an accident i mean yeah <laughs> he used to have this motto and i think cameron haynes kind of kind of it was kind of when when cam and i hooked up we had this thing is like arrows in the quiver don't deliver you got yeah. you had to shoot just some arrows gotta keep shooting like, yeah, and we had these old boning quivers you know that would hold like nine or ten arrows you know and we just right all loaded up and we we're ready to start slinging you yeah know, that's, that's awesome crazy. and you know back in that day you know our backcountry stuff you know we'd go in for you know four or five days at a time and oh my gosh i mean we had 50 60 pound packs of course we're young and we get these right. old aluminum frame packs and we got stuff just you know all over them and we take a gallon of milk and breakfast cereal and all this stuff <laughs> oh man you know? and we'd sink them in we'd sink the milk in some old cold creek that was coming out of a snow bank you know uh-huh. it's like you know there was nothing lightweight you know and today heck i got a 31 pound pack and i don't eat like a king but i can stay for 10 days with yeah. you know one pound pack depending on how much water mm-hmm. i have to carry Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, literally back then a tent you know a lightweight tent was like 24 pounds yeah you know? right wow so we're hauling all this garbage in and, and we discovered llamas early mm-hmm. you know like we gotta have llamas you know yeah. we gotta have babies you know so it went through all that period of time but but no that was that was kind of the beginning of the archery thing okay hunting and you know hunting's cultural i understand because i I've, I've been i i went to i hunted missouri and i hunted kansas was my very first, you know, or, well, it wasn't my first whitetail hunt. I'd actually been on a whitetail hunt before that, but not successful. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you're in Rome, you do as Romans, you know, mm-hmm. so sitting tree stands, you know, I was on a hunt in Alabama that I won in a sales contest with Morel Targets. And, and boy, that old boy, when we got down there, that old outfitter, he, he, he kind of, he'd probably had some guys from the West before. And he told me, he goes, you, he goes, there ain't gonna be no wandering around. <laughs> he puts you in this tree stand and he goes, uh-huh. you don't stay there, son. Yeah. He goes, you get out of that tree stand, you got wandering around, you're gonna mess it up for everybody. Mm-hmm. Those yeah, are li- so little I, deer down there too. Yeah, yeah. So I I I got, you know, I got an instruction on that on the very, very first time I and that was I think that was in Alabama. That that was the very first time I went went on yeah. a, a whitetail hunt, you know. But um i i've I've killed some blacktail out of tree stands um but you know we i've spent 90 percent of my hunting career on the ground spot and stock or calling Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know a lot of elk calling you know you know i i'm definitely not by any means the best elk caller in the world but i feel like i kind of understand the whole calling world and and i've put a lot of bucks in we can rattle our blacktail in you know it's uh in fact the buck i shot this year i rattled in okay gotcha Rattling can be lucrative. I mean, mm-hmm. it can be just an incredible experience rattling. Um, if if it, it, it seems like all the stars have to align on certain days this year, every time I hit the horns together, I had three bucks run in, just boom, Man. boom, boom, you know, shot. A awesome. Good 
all in Very, one day. And <clears> there's <throat> times that, you know, I've rattled probably 30 or 40 times and not had anything. Nothing. Right. Nothing. But when the time's right, you know, and you just happen to hit that day on the right day, you know, and, and the stars align, yeah. you know, for Blacktail, you hit those horns together, everything's running in. It's awesome. So, okay, you're now the owner of the bow rack. You put a lot of sweat equity. I heard that on another podcast and and really got your shop. And I know you've built on and added on since then. Archery's mm-hmm. kind of been a lot of your life. Hunting's a lot of your life. I know you're also an endurance athlete, but for the sake of time, I want to transition a little bit. Um, you are a father. So how, how many children do you have? I have five, five children and I've got five grandchildren and another one on the way. Well, congratulations. That's great. We've got three kiddos and we've got a fourth on the way. So our third son awesome. is coming. So we have Ransom, awesome. Valor, and then Providence is our little girl. And oh, wow. and awesome, then, yeah, thank you. And then our next son, we're, we're thinking Oak. So just like the tree, yeah. and mighty oaks, uh, oaks of righteousness, Isaiah chapter right. 61 says, calls it that they shall be Oaks of righteousness. So uh, that's the idea. Um, having a blast, loving being a dad and right. wanting to be, wanting to be intentional with uh, my sons. And so let, let's go back generationally. You know, there's the era of your dad and and most of those men. So most of the, the younger of the baby boomers, older of the, you know, Gen X guys, a lot of their dads were disconnected, not all, but they were disconnected emotionally, spiritually. They worked hard. Right. They maybe pat you on the back one time. And then you cherish that pat on the back for the rest of your life for that one time that they said, right. I'm proud, I'm proud of you, son. So then the transition then went to a lot of baby boomers. My dad is 65 and the, his era, the guys that I grew up with looking up to growing up in church, they were the promise keepers, men. They were the John oh, yeah. Eldridge guys. They, keepers. they were the awesome. guys that they really wanted to do things differently than their dad kind of thing. And, uh, <clears throat> but a lot of them still didn't figure that out until a lot of my age, until like the, the millennial kids were a little bit older and I, I, heard, I grew up hearing these guys all the time saying, man, I wish I would have known this stuff when my kids were younger. I wish I would have known this. I knew I didn't want to be like my dad or I wanted to be like him in some areas, but I wanted to grow in these other areas. And I feel like I made some of the same mistakes as my father. And so I'm on the front end of this thing, raising sons, and I'm trying to give them a goal. Manhood is uh, God has called us to worship, work, protect, provide, lead, love. And I've got these rites of passages built out for when they're 10 to 18 years old. We're going to have six rites of passages into manhood, becoming a, a man and, and a company of men. We're going to uh, be around them. There's going to be guys from church. And so I'm trying on the front end to do this. So I love thinking about fatherhood. And um, I also don't want to be overbearing, but I do want to be very intentional with them. So what are some lessons you've learned along the way? Because I know your son, Nate, does a lot of films and hunting, and that's kind of been a part of his life. And I don't know about your other children, but how did you raise them up in this this area of, you know, enjoying what you enjoy without trying to, you know, impose that on them or be some weird thing or that you've got to be just like me kind of thing? What are some lessons you've learned along the way about fatherhood? Well, you know, um, gosh, you know, the Brittany is my oldest daughter and then, you know, Nate's, you know, second born, Lindsay's third born. Um, and then Jesse and Savannah, those are, those are my, my children. So four daughters and a son, you know, and, and with Nate, you know, growing up, he just kind of grew up in an archery shop. And so did, so did my, my daughter, Brittany, they, you know, all my kids have basically grown up in the archery shop. Mm-hmm. But I never pushed, you know, archery on them. You know, I'd like, yeah, you want to, you know, it it was just kind of they were around it. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, naturally, you know, I never Nate was just driven, you know, kind of the way I was, you know, and he was kind of wired just almost identically to the way I was, except he's a lot smarter kid. Um, he's a civil engineer now um went all the way through college I don't even know how his mind works because he's a he's a smart guy um I don't know how he's related to me I think he must have got that from his mom but uh (laughs) you know um he just naturally you know delved right into it now my oldest daughter Brittany I mean she's she's a precious woman of God but uh you know never really got much into the outdoor lifestyle I mean Uh you know um uh you know just took, you know, always took kids camping and fishing and hunting and everything. And she never really, you know, never really caught with her. Now my, my daughter, Lindsay, she, she's hunted with me and, and fishing and everything. And they all enjoy that. And she's, she's got a whole nother lifestyle. She manages uh retail. She's been with a lot of different retail stores as a manager. 
Um, and then uh, Jesse, my daughter now, she works with us. And mm -hmm. she's, you know, right now she's, you know, she she works with here in a store, builds arrows, you know, does oh, cool. just about, you know, everything that there is to do here besides, you know, she's not a bow tech, you know, so to speak. She's not working on archery equipment, but everything else in the store she does. And, and as a great employee, uh, our youngest Savannah just graduated high school last summer. Okay, cool. you know? um, so, you know, that's kind of the rundown on the family, but Nate, you know, rolling back to my son lessons, you know, just always really love my kids, you know, um, hard push because I mean, there was times, you know, uh, that, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I swung a hammer, mm -hmm. you know, in the nineties because, you know, we were basically starving to death. I mean, hmm. you know, there wasn't a lot of business for an archery shop in the nineties okay. until to, until 1999, when I built this building and really made the commitment to move, you know, uh, we were just surviving. Okay. You know, gotcha. In fact, when I built this building, I remember I had gone in you know, every year. It seemed like I needed a, a line of credit, you know, to survive in the next year in business. And, uh, you know, that's why it was started to mention Terry Gent, you know, when I, <clears throat> I think it was 1999, there was this, the property I'm on in this building. I, I went to him and I just went up to his office and he was one of my customers. He was a bow hunter and he knew okay. me real well, he knew Lisa real well. And, and, you know, he, I went up to him, I said, there's this piece of property for sale. And he just shoved some blank checks across the table and he goes, look, we'll just open you up on a line of credit. He goes, go buy it, build a building. We'll switch you over to small business loans. So, wow. you know, a lot of, you know, great stuff like that. But all that to say there was, you know, the work ethic, it was hard. You know, there was a lot of hard time, you know, probably my regret. Um, you know, we had good family time, but I would have loved more. I mean, I'm always envious when I see, you know, families that, like I follow this Jones family on Instagram and, and the guy, he made a lot of money young and he's got all these, he's got like five boys. Okay. Always doing Bible study and they just travel the country because he's, you know, he's got, he's got the means to do it. Uh -huh. and, you know, him and his wife and they just mentor these boys and they, they go all over the place and they, I love their Bible studies. They'll take a chapter and he's got these boys memorizing scripture and everything. Oh, that's cool. I mean, I'm envious of that because, mm. you know, I, you know, just to put food on the table, I remember writing checks that I knew I was going to pay a, a $24, you know, insufficient funds fee because I needed groceries for the kids. Oh, wow. You know, and, you know, I remember, you know, always sitting down and, and adding up how many arrows, how many bows, how, how, what, how much I had to run through my till in a day to pay the bills, pay the labor, pay my taxes, pay insurance, mm -hmm. you know, my mortgage payment or my lease payment back in the day before I could have a dime for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of years of that. And I remember going to, you know, a banker one time and I needed a line of credit. And this was before I built my building in the nineties. Yeah. And, and, uh, he had all this paperwork for me to sign and I open it up and I'm flipping through it. And here's this note in there. And it says, it says, it's this business, this, this individual's owned this business for seven years. It's hardly profitable. We've looked at the books, you know, this line of credit, we're, we're going to make some money on him, but you know, what's the point of an archery shop? Mm. And, and I read that note and I'm, looking, and I'm like, am, am I, was I supposed to see this? And he mm -hmm. grabs it real quick and he goes, no, mm -hmm. it, 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 it burnt something into me. And I'm like, okay, I'm just living my passion here. Mm -hmm. And I think it was at that point, it was about year seven that I started working outside the shop. I'm like, if I'm really going to work, you know, and, and there was just always, when you say work ethic there, you know, that's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, there's, there's guys that don't have work ethic in today's times. And I'm worried about that. I see a lot of generation coming up and they're stuck on a phone or they're in prison yeah. in a, you know, in a, in a different lifestyle that, that has no work ethic. Mm -hmm. But there has to be a balance. And I was probably on the other end of the spectrum as okay. far as balance. And there's there's some regret there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as far as like, you know, what what I if I had a do over, but, you yeah. know, but, you know, I did love the kids dearly, you know, and I think, you know, that that definitely, you know, I, I, I you know, and Nate, he's he's a good kid. We have a close relationship. Good. Uh, I think he's on his way to California. It's either this weekend or next weekend. He's going down to go hunting. 
uh, oh. Blacktail. It opens early. Okay. And, yeah. You know, wow. So I'm sure he'll be self filming and you'll see, you know, something posted on Indicott films on YouTube, but I'm yeah. kind of biased. I mean, I like, I, I love his films, but you know, um, he does a good job. I had the relationship that my dad and I didn't have, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. until later in life. I mean, when, when I was, you know, way along, I lost my father in 09 and, you know, the okay. last probably 15 years of his life. I mean, we were close. Okay. You know, so my, my father and I's relationship, you know, returned. Good. And, you know, there was a lot of respect and everything there. And, you know, I shared with him all the time. I'm not going to, I'm hoping I'm going to see him in heaven, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to tell you I know for sure he's there. You know, right. uh, I had a lot of time to share with him. You know, he knew definitely, you know, what, what my, you know, he watched my life all the way through and, yeah. Thing and, and, uh, you know, was friend, you know, my dad became good friends with a lot of my friends and, you know, everything. And, and he used to like, when I built this archery shop, he was in his eighties and he okay. came down every single day. He was here early with me and I tried to run him off. I'm like, dad, it's pouring down rain today. I'll oh, leave me alone. I'm having fun. He's <laughs> That's cool. Do whatever. And he didn't have any carpentry background, you know, because I would hear I'd been framing houses all this time. So I was, you know, I was building this shop myself. You know, and yeah. he just, you know, he's like, he was always like, son, what are you going to do next? And I'm like, uh -huh. well, foundation down, I go, is, you know, as, as soon as we get these forms stripped, you know, I got that lumber pile coming in today and, you know, we're, we got a lumber package coming in. We're going to be framing. Uh -huh. And he, so he was just enamored watching, you know, because, you That's know, good. it's like, anything, you know, I, if I went to my son's work and I watched what he did, I have no concept of it. You know, I'd be pretty fascinated with what he yeah. does. Right. Because I have no concept of it, no skill set. Well, that was my way my dad was when I was building this shop. You know, here yeah. I've been working, you know, residential framing and, and commercial construction. I'd I'd had, I think, five years, five winters of experience, you know, with that, you know, okay. rolling into building this building. So it was a good skill set. Yeah. And dad was just like, What's this where'd this come from? You know, yeah. you're a you grew up as a farm kid and you've been running an archery shop and now you're building a building. Yeah, right. You well know, that's so, that's that's but, but but as far as raising kids if there's any i mean just just love your kids you know and i good. you know to this day i i go home and even last night got a little you know uh go home and you know my wife and i are a little wrestling match over you know over leadership you know and i'm like well you know they were watching some cartoon and and we don't have tv we don't have cable they they could do netflix but, okay you know, occasionally the tv's on i mean and she even reminded me that she goes you know we don't watch tv mm -hmm. and i'm like well you know it just there's a lot of violence in that i think we were watching kung fu panda or whatever okay yeah oh my gosh I get it. <laughs> kids are all sitting there i'm like okay yeah we've got one young little guy um little makoa he's 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 got a little problem with with hitting right now he's okay he's yeah boy, small boy. Part, part of Man, it he's a handful i'm like okay that's it's probably not what he should be watching. <laughs> right. Well, I you think know? with, I, I love just hearing the emphasis on, you know, love your kids. And I think with every generation, we reflect on our fathers. We want to yeah. emu emulate and replicate the things that were good, the things that, you know, even if they didn't know the Lord, that God in his common grace gave them the abilities to do certain things well. And I think all of us are trying to repeat that. And then I think with every generation, I think my sons will reflect on how I raise them. And then they'll want to grow in certain areas and they'll say, okay, I want to do this area this thing a little bit better. And mm -hmm. I think it is important for us to look back and honor our parents, honor our fathers, and then replicate the good and then grow in the areas that, you know, that they didn't get that great and uh, not focus on it, not hammer them for it, but just say, you know, I want to do that better. And, uh, and, and so if, I, yeah. And if anything, you know, I want to be a father in the faith to my kids as well. Absolutely. That's what we want. You know, and, and, you know, I look, I had a lot of, like, like, you know, my, fa my ex-father-in-law, you know, he's, he's passed away now, but oh my gosh, he used to sit me down and, you know, he would just really instill in me, you know, just precious treasures of the word, you know, Amen. and, and there was one thing that he, you know, never left me. He used to tell me, he goes with Wayne, whatever thing that you do, he goes, you be very, very careful to give all the glory to God, Amen. everything. And he would always end every prayer with that. He goes, mm -hmm. well, you know, he, every single prayer that he ever, you know, when I was around him for so many years, you know, he would always just, we're going to be very, very careful to give you all the praise and glory. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and every, every single prayer with that, you know, a very humble man and just love Jesus. And, and, you know, so with my kids, I've always tried to do that. You know, I, I've tried to be a father in the face. And to this day, you know, I'll send them stuff all the time, 
you know, um, I've got, I, you know, every once in a while I'll see something from, you know, Paul Washer or, or, or Richard Ellis or, you know, any number of guys that are social media influencers, mm-hmm. you know, I'll send it to them, you mm-hmm. know, all the time. And, and, you know, my middle daughter, she, you know, she was struggling and she met, you know, I've been praying for, her, you know, she'd been struggling in the world and everything. And she probably my one, you know, really wayward, you know, wayward daughter. And she met a fella here about, you know, eight, you know, six months ago. And he's, he's strong believer, you know, awesome. and they're, you know, they're serious and, and it just brought her full circle. So, Thanks God. Know, so all your kids know yeah, the Lord. It's just a giant answer to prayer and, and stuff. And she brought him up and we met him and, you know, Brian, he's just a great kid and, and uh, loves the Lord and everything. And, good. and so, you know, they're in a good direction and going to, you know, going to a good fellowship and everything. And, and so, you know, all the years of sin, and, you know, but, but anyway, that, that, that's as, as important as anything is that, you know, like that Jones family I was talking about that's on mm-hmm. Instagram. I mean, oh my gosh, uh, I just, I just love that, you know, yeah, praise the, God. That's... you know, that's, that's first and foremost, you know, and, and there was, there was probably times that I wasn't, you know, uh, you know, as a young parent, you know, but, you know, there was, you know, I always wanted to take time and just even, even when I was struggling and I wasn't where I should have been with the Lord, I always made sure like the kids, I mean, like, well, okay, well, we got to go back to the foundation here. You know, yeah. I'm a parent and, you know, I want to be a godly parent. If yeah. I do everything else wrong in my life, you know, we're going to represent the Lord with the children. That's right. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's that, the hope. That's, Multi-generational faithfulness, man. And being able yeah. to see God in our generations, be see, see God at work. And that's, that's the hope is we want to see, you know, if we'll take family serious and uh, yeah. be a, get, be a godly patriarch and then be able to be in our older age and look down and see, man, look what God has done. I think that's what we're all hoping for, you know, yeah, and, and uh, like, like my little grand, I, I got, a, I got some grandbabies and I think I've had an opportunity to do it with them all, but you know, I'll pull up like Guy Penrod singing the Revelation song on YouTube and, mm-hmm. and I'll have them on my lap and I'll just be singing away with that, you know, and they'll just awesome. sit there and sing. And, and, you know, it's just, it's just great, you know, to see those kids, just a little, little tiny, you know, grandkids that I've got, you know, and just see them, you know, singing and looking and watching and looking at, you know, grandpa singing and worshiping. And, you know, I want, I want my kids to see that, you know, and yeah. see the you know, just boldly, you know, worship in the Lord. And it's, good. And it's, just, it's precious to see them, ex- you know, how they accept that, love that. And like, you know, two of my grandkids, you know, they're, they're hanging out on the farm with us right now. They were gone for uh, a year in Idaho on a, and, and her, you know, my second to youngest, her husband had a job up, up, up in, in Idaho and okay. they moved back. And so I've got those two grandkids and it's just great to gives me a whole nother they're they're staying on the farm with us and and living in a fifth wheel on the farm and and right. uh and the daughter's back to work here at the archery shop but awesome. you know just having those grandkids again that's the second lease on life to be a parent again you know? yeah that's so fun looking and looking forward to that kids and stuff but it's 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 just a giant blessing to have grandkids and at the same time there's not many days that that i I go through my devotions in the morning and I I'm not on my knees and, and, and lifting those kids up and putting, yeah. you know, pleading a hedge of protection around them because Amen. the world we're living in right now, as we all know, and I hate even talk about it, but you know, the state we're in right now, you know, we know mm-hmm. the Lord's in control, but it's the time we're living in, but you know, covering them with prayer. Yeah, is absolutely. So important. Critical, critical. You know, with all I do with all my kids, even, my siblings that you know, I grew up with, you know, um, I was the last of the Mohicans in a blended family. And, uh, you know, I, I pray for them and just recently been, you know, feeling more convicted to pray for my siblings more and yeah. more. Yep. You know, so. That's good. Well, let's uh, wrap this up, Wayne. And I want to ask sure. a question that uh, really just to set you up to do what your father, you said your father-in-law always did, which is end with the praise and glory of God. And so I'm just going to ask your question, brother, why do you love Jesus? Oh my gosh. I mean, he's, he's my everything. I mean, he's my foundation. He's my rock. He's my savior. He's my Lord. Um, and, and, and when, you, when I say he's my Lord, he he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Every knee's going to bow. I mean, you know, to say he's my Lord, he is the Lord. You know, I just recognized him and surrendered mm-hmm. at a young age. And, you know, um, as far as, you know, life and breath and everything. I mean, every day 
I am just excited to be alive and thankful to be alive that he's given me this, this opportunity to be here and to share the Lord with others, you Amen. know, and, and from, from this point in my life on, you know, to share the love of Jesus and what he's done in my life with others at every mm -hmm. given opportunity I can. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the most important thing to me. And I, I've, I've been blessed to have that opportunity here lately because of these podcasts I've had, mm -hmm. I, I just did a, a men's get together at uh, Gold Creek, uh, Gold Creek Christian Fellowship. Thanks. It's up in Snohomish, Washington. I was invited up there because of the podcast I did with Cameron Haynes and mm -hmm. kind of shared the Lord and everything. And just that opportunity to, to allow the Holy spirit to use me as a tool in, yeah. and, and to go up there and share my testimony and, and, and share the Lord, you know, um, in just a, just kind of a, I, I I you know Richard Ellis calls it Richard Ellis talks. I don't know if you've ever seen Richard Ellis on mm -hmm. YouTube, but you, you should type him up. You, you know, Paul, I, I got I got some mentors, you know, Phil the and Paul Washer and and Richard Ellis. I mean, as far as like fathers in the faith, they don't know it, but I watch those guys on YouTube and mm -hmm. I probably not many probably not many uh, 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 broadcasts that they've had that I haven't, you know, wandered through uh, in my morning you know, mm -hmm. workout routine or run that I don't have them plugged into my ear, but, right. um, you know, God's blessed those men and they're, they're blessing to others, you know, but, but Jesus is my, he, he's my savior. He's my Lord. He, you know, he's very real to me. Um, he's love. Yeah. I mean, you know, I That's think, uh, I think Jesus culture, you know, love has a name. That's mm -hmm. Jesus. I never knew it before. That's the mm -hmm. thing. I came from a no, christian background at all none in fact anti-church background and then to come to know to jesus i mean i could never describe salvation any other way besides that the lord reached down and touched me and loved amen me. amen and have, to have awesome. that love in your life to have that bubbling up as a spring in your life and the joy you know happiness i always sought after happiness before that and mm -hmm. it was a big deal it just escaped it was like running from you it was like a mirage on the on the landscape you're always running after but you know, joy just floods you over and it's right. just a blessing of God. And, you know, and that's just, you know, the kingdom of God's here and now. Yeah, absolutely. And it's to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so from this life to the next, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be all that. So in, 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 you know, how do you describe, you know, such a fabulous. <laughs> I know, right. Uh, Praise so God. Hard. Yeah, it is really, it's really hard other than the fact that everything that I am and, everything that's been given to me and all of life is Jesus. Amen. I mean, you know, that's... and, 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 and the word of God is so precious. I mean, there's <laughs> individuals there, you know, the, the great I am. I mean, I'm the way, the truth and the life. I'm the alpha, the omega, you know, I, it's just, it, you know, every I am from, you know, when Moses asked the Lord, who do I say that you are? Mm -hmm. I, I am, you yeah. know, Amen. It's, it is the I am. And he's all That's of good us. Stuff. You know, we're just a, a piece of clay and, and he loved us enough to come save Amen. us and send his son to do that. Amen. You know, and when That's you awesome. really understand that from a no background of understanding to, 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 you know, didn't get raised in church, wasn't a Sunday school kid, didn't have any concept of it, not even one Bible verse to today. That's who Jesus is. Amen. He's, he's the, way, the truth and the life. And, That's awesome. and, and to know the truth and it'll set you free. It'll, it doesn't say it'll set you free. It makes you free. Yeah. Amen. That's why Christians, when they backslide, there's no real backs. You can't, you can't run from God. Yeah. He gets you he's always there. Yeah, because that's right. He'll never leave you or forsake you. But more than that, you know, you shall know the truth and truth shall make you free. And yeah. it, it, you're never free from it. Yeah. You know, so it's good stuff, it's man. Bring you back to his, his goodness every time. So, you know, that's that's who Jesus is to me. Amen. Well, Wayne, this has been a lot of fun, and I will give a plug and put links in the show notes. Everybody needs to check out the Bow Rack, and also I'll put a link <laughs> into that that great podcast episode with Cam Haynes. That was a lot of fun just hearing those stories, hearing those Roy Ross stories as well, oh, yeah. and just the whole oh, thing. Cam, just a, Cam and I have a lot of history together, and I, I love him to death. He's just he's got some great things going, and and you know, Lord's using him as a tool. I mean, he's had some great people on his podcast. And, yeah. Yep. And just it's it's just a broad range of of, uh, of 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 love and education, and it's just a different different aspect. But mm -hmm. uh, 
we got a yeah. big event coming here at the end of this month. He's got 55 guys coming. You know, one guy's coming all the way from South Wales, Australia. Oh, my. Yeah. And they're going to come cool. in. Cam's, we're we're going to do the archery part of it. And Cam's going to hurt him physically. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. He's good <laughs> at that. And at the end of it all, I'm excited because we got a 10K mountain run. So oh, that sounds I'm awesome. That, that. that sounds that, that that would be right up my alley. That sounds like fun. Yeah, uh, it is. Sounds like torture, but sounds like fun. Uh, yeah. Well, hey, guys, this has uh, been great. Um, we just thanks so much for, for coming on the show, Wayne, making time. Appreciate it. And uh, everybody listening in, please follow those links. Check out that that information and buy some stuff from the bow rack if you can. And we've been <laughs> talking to Wayne Endicott. Wayne, thanks for coming on, brother. Hey, you bet, brother. Thank you.